<laughs> they, uh, Stuart uh, tricked me. Well, he didn't trick me, but yes. I knew it was coming. I saw that. Are you planning no, anything no, sneaky? I'll be, I'll be nice. Oh, okay, good. Okay. Terrific. Well, we'll be nice this morning too. Um, Dr. Paul, your favourite hymn. Can you think of your favourite hymn? Whether it's an English hymn or a Danish hymn? I, I can think of a lot of hymns. I, I love music. Um, should I pick one just out of the blue? It's likely to be um, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross mm. on the right melody. That is uh, actually the, the old Gregorian chant. It is also the, the two melodies in the hymnal. This is the one. When I survey the wondrous cross, and so on. Mm. That's, that's uh, 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 to me, uh, a wonderful melody, mm. but there are so many. There are so many, so, so, mm. um, so it's just one of them. Lovely. Jake, we could have used him in the singing, I think. That was lovely. Thank you. Um, Stuart asked me a question that this morning that I thought was a really good question. Did you have an answer? I think I, yes, I did answer it. If you had one sermon to preach, what would it be? Well, <laughs> uh, honestly, uh, as, a, uh, as a preacher, I at least always have grown, very quickly grown tired of my sermons. I have very rarely repeated any sermon. Of course, I usually don't write out the, the, the complete manuscript because you get stuck by it. Uh, but um, even then, I, I work over once again if it's the same uh, sermon, uh, basically. But I have actually one sermon that I have preached up to 20 times for the last couple of years uh, in, in, in uh, many places of the world. And I even did it here for the young people, a little adapted to their style, you know, but, but uh, I probably would do that again. It's a sermon on the love of God. Mm. And um, it is one out of probably two sermons of which I haven't really grown tired mm. uh, of, of hearing myself. Mm. It'll, it, it'll be a theme that we will um, witness, be witness to right throughout eternity, the love of God, won't it? Last question for North New Zealand camp for this, for this time round. What is perhaps the one thing that you are looking forward to the most about heaven? Now that's a, a difficult one because we all know what, what we expect to say. Do we? I mean, you have already said it, uh, to, to be with Jesus. And of course that is true. But I, I want to, to, to be a little more human. Uh, there are two things, maybe. I'd like to spend maybe 1,000 years to, to try to be taught by Emmanuel to sing. <laughs> and if I don't succeed, I can always do something else. Now, <laughs> and then, well, a second one, somewhat inspired by C.S. Lewis, who wrote these wonderful uh, Chronicles of Narnia, a kind of analogy for, for kids on on how salvation would work if it was in another world. Now, when they come to the new earth, there's one thing that happens. They begin to run. Up streams, downhill, uphill, and suddenly they realize they, they endure the nature, they uh, endure being moving, and suddenly realize they don't become tired. And, and um, I would like to be able to run as I could when I was younger and, and, and simply to enjoy that part of being God's creation. We are created for movement. I know that our movements become slower and slower as time passes, but we are created for, for movement. And let's remember that because that's part of being a joyful creature in the image of God. So, so, so that's a little more personal and, and not in some sense, you would say, well, that's not very spiritual, but um, the physical part of our lives are a part of the spiritual as well. Mm. Yeah, that's a lovely answer. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we want to thank Pastor Paul for what he's uh, been sharing with us this week. Um, it's been, been fascinating to see a few different insights 
into a book that, uh, as you did tell us, Dr. Paul, is very special to your heart, uh, the book of Daniel, which you spent a few what, years with your dissertation. Yeah. Let's have a word of prayer together. Our wonderful Father in heaven, indeed, Lord, your name is wonderful. We thank you, Lord, that it is at that name that every knee will bow and tongue confess that you are Lord. Lord, we thank you that you are our God. We thank you that you take a deep interest in the things that concern us. And Lord, this morning as we sit together with our Bibles open and our hearts receptive, Lord, we ask that you will please teach us yourself, that you'll please bless Pastor Paul as he shares with us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Our last study in the book of Daniel on worship. I have entitled When Worship is a Question. I have prepared 25 slides. Usually I've only done 15. So now <laughs> um, I'll probably use half an hour more. No, I, I try to stick to the time. But some have asked me wh whether it's possible to get a a hand on these and it is I have made a print out and if you go to the administration building just over here you will be able to get a copy these are of course private don't publish them but uh, <laughs> uh, probably nobody will be able to understand the meaning of it unless they have been here anyway but uh, it is possible, so anyone who would like to have a copy can go over there, and then they will get a feeling of, of how many. They have just, of course, copied a few for, at the moment, and then they will see. Now, worship as a question. What does that mean? Let's move into the question. We have the question twice. Actually, we had the three times. But we had the direct question twice in the last part of the book of Daniel. You have heard at least one of these questions before, from Daniel 8, verse 13. I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to him, How long will it take before the vision is completed? And then you know the answer with the 2,300 evenings and mornings. Now, when you go to chapter 12, a similar question is raised after a conversation between two heavenly beings. One of them said to the man clothed in linen, who was about to who was about the above, probably should be the text, the waters of the river. How long will it take before these astonishing, thing, astonishing things are fulfilled? And then you have also an answer related to time. These are the two major prophecies, two out of three major pro prophecies in the last part of the book. And they are, they are closing with this question, how long? This is a typical Old Testament question. Let's take a few texts from the Psalms and you could go through a concordance or just read through on your own. And you will in the Psalms and in some of the prophets find this question popping up again and again. Literally, you could say, until when? Because the question moves to the end and say, when will you intervene, God? When will you appear come? My soul is in anguish, the psalmist says. How long, Lord? How long? Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Or Psalm 35, verse 7. O Lord, how long will you look on? Rescue my life from their ravages, my precious life from these lions. And so you can find in many of the texts in the Psalms, whenever you are in crisis, you cry out to God, God, how long? That is, God, will you come and intervene, deliver me, help me? So the question, how long, or until when, is a question that indicates lament or complaining. Now, we, it's not nice to complain, is it? We always teach our children not to complain. But notice that in the Bible, 
half of the songs on the prayers are complaints. They are not necessarily critical to God, but still they are complaints. God, I am not feeling well. You have promised to help me do something about it. And actually, remember, it's allowed to pray in that way. It's natural. God rather wants us to complain to him than not to speak to him at all. Complaining is not necessarily an expression of doubt. It is an expression of what we actually feel and experience. And life is not just, what you say in English, a bed of roses. At least there are some thorns on there as well. Now, let's move to the book of Daniel, because we saw that in the first part of Daniel, we had all the happy endings. Now, if you look carefully on the screen, even very carefully, you probably will not see all the details. It doesn't matter that much. I will, I will move a little quickly here, because that would be the extra half hour if was, well, I was to enter this issue. But the book of Daniel is very well structured. That means it's not only revealed to God, from God to Daniel, it is also inspired by the Spirit so that when he writes, he, he writes in a very structured manner. There's a message. And you have all the happy endings, the deliverance from the lion's den, the deliverance from the fiery furnace, the ending of in praise, the promotion, and so on. That's the first part. Chapter 7 belongs to both first and second part. Chapter 7 is unique. It's in Aramaic like the, the previous chapters, but it is a prophecy like the subsequent chapters. It ends on the kingdom of God, just like chapter 2, while chapter 8, 9, and 10 to 11 ends with the question. But when you go to the second part, Daniel B., there is an uncertainty. You remember how, how the book closes? Daniel, you will go to sleep and then you will stand up at the day of judgment and then you will see what happens. That is not very assuring, isn't it? It is a note of uncertainty. So in that part, which is introduced by the Aramaic vision in chapter 7, then Hebrew prophecies from Daniel 8, 9 and 10 to 11, that is one big all prophecy. In those chapters, we end on a note of uncertainty. We have the question, how long? And we will move on within shortly to, to the prayer in Daniel 9 to see that the same mood is there. Let's see how the structure works, just as a brief uh, conclusion or summary. Daniel A, the first part of Daniel, has the introduction in chapter 1 in Hebrew, followed by chapters in Aramaic. Now, chapter 7 belongs to both. That is like a hinge on the book. That is the Aramaic introduction to the prophecies that follow in Hebrew. In the first part, in part A, you have praise and thanksgiving and all the happy endings. In the second part, you have always questions, lament. How long? In the first part, you have the assurance of thanksgiving, the, the sense that God is near. That is what is expressed when you give thanks. You feel God is near. In the second part, there is this uncertainty. When will the kingdom arrive? What does all this mean? What is the significance? Sometimes scholars are able to produce a lot of strange comparisons. Does it mean anything? I think it does. In the book of Daniel, there is a balance between praise and lament. Now, if you go to the book of Bi the Bible in general, these two types of prayers are the basic types. They sprang out of either a situation where you feel God has intervened and you give thanks and then, then you realize 
that he is not only to be praised in this specific situation, but this is how he always is. And you praise him in general. Or you complain because you have a need. You petition. And you may elaborate on, on the situation. Sometimes the psalmist would describe it in may, with many strong words, even in poetry about the enemies. And he would, will, as we do in, in poetry, sometimes exaggerate. Do you know that if you would make a survey among Christians in general, which book in the Old Testament is the most popular? There's no doubt about it. It's a book of Psalms. Do you know why? Because you have all sorts of human emotions expressed there. There will always be something for somebody. If you are in a bad mood, you will find in the Psalms people who complain. And you will feel, okay, I can speak to God too, even though I'm in a bad mood. And if you are happy and grateful, you will find that too. It speaks to everyone. And in the book of Daniel, you have the same balance. Life is not only wonderful, there is also tragedy. So that's the balance. Next, that is illustrated what we, with what we often call the now and yet not yet in history. We have the presence of God, we have the promises of God, we have the, the assurance in Christ that God is with us. Yet, though his kingdom of grace is here, his kingdom has not really arrived. So we look forward to the second coming. There is a balance between cross and glory. We go through the cross before we come to the glory. Just like Jesus, just like King David actually had to do. Why should he suffer all that? This somewhat innocent young lad with, uh, with a temper because he was to be a type of Messiah. He went through all this suffering in order to, real, to, to show that suffering comes before glory. Now, there's another function within the book of Daniel. If you read the narratives of Daniel, as a child only, and as an adult you jump directly into the prophecies. You may miss this point, but remember Daniel is a short book, and it is uh, polite to any author to, to, to read the book from the beginning, isn't it? So when you read about the prophecies, and the tribulations, and the delay, and the question, how long God? then you may be feeling a sense of uncertainty. But you have just read the stories, and therefore you are assured that though it takes some time, God will deliver and rescue. So, so the stories provide the assurance. God will end the crisis sometime. And when you look back and read the stories, or look back and read the stories of the Bible, that is the same function. You may feel, oh, will it never end? But then you read and you trust because you read that God has intervened before. He will do it again. Now, you could say, why is he not doing it? What is the problem? Why all this questioning and uncertainty? And that is what we're going to find out by reading in Daniel 9. The prayer in Daniel 9 will explain to us what is the basic problem, not only for Daniel at his time, but for all human beings. What is the solution is also presented. Let's read a few sections from the prayer. First, the invocation or the address. Whenever you, we have a prayer, you ad address God and you may elaborate by describing who he is. In the Lord's Prayer we say, Our Father, then we elaborate, who art in heaven. 
or who are in heaven, which is probably better understood by most kids these days. The invocation. Oh, please my Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant and maintains his unfailing love towards all who love him and keep his commands. And then comes the confession. We have sinned. We have committed iniquity. We have acted wickedly and we have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and your just decisions and we have not listened to your servants the prophets who in your name spoke to our kings, our princes and our fathers and to all the people of the land. Whenever you have a lament, you will find that, that the one who prays elaborates on the circumstances. If you are ill, you may describe the illness a little more. If you are the king of Israel and the enemies have attacked you, you may speak about the enemies or poverty. Very often, you will find that confession becomes part of the lament because the reason for the situation may be that I have sinned. Let's move to what I call the acknowledgement. It's a long prayer and we don't read all of it and there are several parts of the acknowledgement. This is uh, the second major part where Daniel describes part of the situation. Because we rebelled against you and did not obey Yahweh our God, so that we walked in accordance with his instructions, which he set before us by his servants and prophets. And all Israel broke your law and turned away from without obeying you. The sworn curse written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, has been poured down upon us. You know, it was prophesied back in Deuteronomy. And Daniel is referring to these verses from Deuteronomy. Acknowledging their guilt, describing the history. And then comes the supplication. O Lord, in accordance with all your acts of salvation, please let your anger and wrath turn back from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. Notice that the city and the mountain goes together. For because of our sins and the iniquities of our ancestors, Jerusalem and your people have become objects of scorn among all your neighbors, our neighbors. And now listen, our God, to your servants' prayer and supplications. Let your face shine over your destroyed sanctuary for the sake of my Lord. Daniel is putting in some phrases that indicate his personal relationship. You hear him speaking to, to his personal master. By the way, when you say, let your face shine, where do you find that? Let your face shine upon us. That is part of the Aaronic blessing, which at least many ministers try to learn by heart, and in order to be sure they know where it is in, in Numbers 6, so they can find it in the spur of the moment. Because it's embarrassing to stand there and be, able, uh, and be supposed to give the blessing and suddenly uh, do, do not remember the words. What is unique here is, this is a common phrase. Let your face shine over or upon. And everywhere in the scripture, God's face is shining upon people. Except for this one verse. Shining on the sanctuary. After the supplication, Daniel becomes more specific and sends up his petition. Incline, my God, your ear and hear. Open your eyes and take notice of our complete desolation and of the city that is attached to your name. Not based on our own righteous deeds do we entreat you with our supplications, but relying on your great mercy alone. My Lord, listen. My Lord, pardon. My Lord, hear and act. Make no delay. 
for your own sake, my God, for your name is attached to your city and to your people. The specific prayer of Daniel turns up here. Make no delay. The mood is the same as in the previous chapter and as in chapter 12. How long? It is related to time. God, wait no longer. Make no delay. Let's look at the situation of this prayer. Daniel is in exile. The city and the temple in Jerusalem is desolated. Most of the people is also in exile. And Daniel has been given a vision in chapter 8 with an unexplained time prophecy and containing themes that are rephrased somewhat but also present in the prayer. The sin and apostasy leading to desolation and destruction. The wrath of God, remember that, turn away your wrath and your anger. It's also present in chapter 8. And then he, he has in this uh, vision heard Holy One speaking about an action that is going to take place towards the sanctuary. 2,300 evening and mornings, so then the sanctuary shall be cleansed or justified or vind vindicated. And he prays to God in order to entreat him to let his face shine upon the destroyed sanctuary. This is his situation. He is uncertain about the fate of Jerusalem and his people. What is the problem? Let's look at it. There are two. There is the basic problem, the cause of all the trouble. Sin and apostasy. The people was in exile because they had sinned. Daniel clearly acknowledges that. We are still here because of sin. Not necessarily just you or mine individual sin, but because of sin. This is a problem. What are the consequences? To Daniel, the consequences at that moment in time was the destruction of the temple and Jerusalem. If something could be done about their sin, if they could confess it as promised, God would send, give them the chance to return. So you have the cause, the sin, the consequences to Daniel, destruction and exile. The divine solution is found in two, in two items. First of all, the prophecy, which we are not going to read or go into detail, the prophecy in Daniel 9, points out that the solution to the problem of sin is Messiah, the sacrifice. So the prophecy, on one hand, speaks about the coming of Messiah as a sacrifice, taking care of the fundamental cause of all the consequences that we face in a world of sin. The second part of the answer, the divine solution, is linked to the sanctuary. Daniel had a specific problem. He was concerned with the sanctuary in Jerusalem and the temple because he was an Israelite. That was natural. And the answer explains to him that there are two covenants there are two temples. There is an earthly temple, part of the covenant with your people, and then there is a holy, most holy sanctuary in heaven. Let's just read one verse, verse 24, where Gabriel tells Daniel that 70 weeks are determined for your people and your holy city. That is the period cut off that concerns Daniel's people and city as an Israelite. But something else will happen. To finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, that is what Messiah does, what Christ does. To bring in everlasting righteousness, this is what Christ did. To seal up mission and sin, and to anoint a most holy sanctuary. 
that is to dedicate another sanctuary that is a heavenly one. So Daniel is told about the limitation in time for his people and his city in Jerusalem. But the divine solution takes him further to the heavenly sanctuary. Let us summarize for the prayer. It is an individual prayer and we are concerned about worship. There are a lot of phrases that indicate that Daniel is speaking to his personal God. Suddenly he is changing from our God to my God. It becomes very personal. It's also a lament. The confession is part of the lament. And notice this is the mood of the second part of the book. Just as in Daniel 8, how long, or in chapter 12, how long. And then Daniel is interceding. He's praying on behalf of his people. I have actually heard a lot of people who are dissatisfied with what is going on in the church. Have you ever met people like that? Is there a reason to be dissatisfied now and then? Yes, we are humans. That's not surprising. I could find a lot of reasons to be dissatisfied. I think Daniel could as well. But note how his attitude is. It is not all the other people have sinned, Lord. It's we have sinned. Daniel is not standing on the side of the accuser of the brethren. We are all part of it. We are all part of it. Intercession means that you take upon yourself the burden of sin. Isn't it interesting that in this may be the greatest intercessory prayer in all the Bible where Daniel takes upon himself, though innocent in one sense, not, not in complete sense, but innocent in the sense that he was not the cause of the exile, he takes upon the sins of the people, and then he receives a prophecy that speaks about the Messiah, who in a unique sense takes upon himself the sins of the people. The prayer is intercessory. Daniel reflects Messiah. So what is the divine solution? In the book of Daniel, the divine solution has many names. In the second part of Daniel, here are some of them. Daniel 8, 11 speaks about the prince of the host, the person against whom the little horn directs its attack. The phrase, the prince of the host is identical with the phrase you find in the book of Joshua when Joshua is called outside this camp and meets the prince of the army that's the same phrase the solution is in the book of Daniel found in Messiah the prince the anointed which is the meaning of Messiah or in the long long prophecy of Daniel 11 in the one who's called the Prince of the Covenant, who is destroyed. So you have, in chapter 8, a vision speaking about a long time period. In chapter 9, you have a very long prayer underscoring the delay. And in chapter 11, you have a very, very long prophecy, and you wait, and you wait, will it never finish? It goes together. The question, the solution is Messiah, the solution to sin. Let me uh, add a little extra. In just a detail, in Daniel 9, 26, the phrase is used about the anointed one, or Messiah, that he was cut off after that 62 weeks, the anointed one will be cut off. You may not know, 
because it, because it has not in general been noted, but the word that is used in the same form, by the way, in passive form, I put in the, the Hebrew word here, the word that is used here for cut off is a word that is several times in the Old Testament in the section on the law used to indicate execution. Spoken about the person who has despised the Lord's word and broken his commands, that person must surely be cut off. His guilt remains on him. So the phrase itself in Daniel 9 said about the anointed Messiah indicates that he was executed, cut off from his people. This is the solution. And the sanctuary in which he is our representative, our high priest, is what is our daily assurance. Even when we raise the question, how long? Someday it will close. Let's summarize. I look at my watch because I, I promise not to, to go this half hour over time, though I have more put in more uh, slides this morning. So um, I want to, to, to have time to summarize with you because this is a kind of summary for, for the whole week. Worship in the end time. I've tried to summarize that in, in five sentences which I will then elaborate on. First of all, genuine worship presupposes a personal relationship with God. Let me remind you of some of the, the issues in Daniel we have faced. The, the answer from the three friends, even if God does not deliver us, we will not worship you idol. An expression of a personal friendship that is indicated by the fact that God comes near them and walks with them in the fiery furnace an unconditional obedience because it is a relationship that does not ask for what do I get out of it but simply is based on mutual love our love responding to God's love or you find it expressed in chapter 7 when Daniel is uh, approached by Darius the king who says the God whom you continually serve or you find it that in the fact that Daniel is praising God in both prosperity and crisis, in his calm prayer assurance in Daniel 6. If you look at the history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, there may be local differences, but there is definitely a general development. If I go back two generations in my home country, at least in Denmark, and we made a survey about this issue some years ago in Norway, you will find that a lot of people in the church were very sure that they belonged to the people of God. But they were not sure they were the children of God. I had, have a good colleague who is an excellent preacher, and he went about to churches for a period and asked them, do you believe that we are the people of God? And people would raise up their hands, yes, we do. How many of you be, believe that you are a child of God? And then people were a little uncertain. I hope that is changing. I also hope we don't go to the extreme that we do not any longer know that we have a divine calling as a people. But certainly, the personal relationship is a basis for corporate worship. My next point, worship is to be offered in a period or during a period of waiting. This is a new one that is from today's study. The book closes with a, an announcement, blessed is the one who waits. Now, the mood of waiting, if you go to the Psalms, let me just throw in Psalm 130, you will find several Psalms that speak about waiting 
and they are usually connected in Jewish tradition at least with the Day of Atonement, with the Day of Judgment. You wait for God to come. We are in the mood of the Day of Judgment when we raise the question, how long? When will you intervene, God? And we are therefore in the mood of waiting. It's difficult to wait. It's very difficult to wait because we want to um, improve on the situation. We want to, to change it. We may become impatient. We want, especially in this country, here and now results. But in life, there is reason for lament as well as for praise. Now, I emphasized the other morning that certainly the Seventh-day Adventist Church and Seventh-day Adventist should have reasons to give thanks to God and to praise Him. This is where we're always moving. There is a pendulum in the Old Testament between lament and praise, but it's always moving in the direction of praise. But there are, in the present age, within the Christian uh, world community, movements that, that tend to say, no, we should not have any kind of lament in worship at all. I'll tell you why I disagree for several reasons. First of all, I don't think it's biblical. The Bible contains both. We need to keep the balance. Next, when I look at the pastoral aspect, if we have worship services where there is never any chance of expressing the feelings of suffering, of tragedy, of defeat, we are pushing away a lot of people. Now, if we force everyone to feel happy, even if they are not happy, I think we're doing something wrong. Our church is also to be a hospital for sinners, isn't it? That is, that you come here and you are able to say, I don't feel good. I know we're supposed to say, well, in America especially, you know, how, how are you today? I'm fine, you know, you have to say that. I, I used to say something different, uh, just, just to tease people because, you know, it's you, you, just words you say, you don't mean anything. In our church, people who are suffering sh have to be able to feel that they are actually welcome and they are part of it. And you cannot say to people who have lost their dear ones, oh, you should be happy. That's not natural. It's not biblical. We have therefore to have a balance between praise and lament for pastoral reasons. And I tell you, I know people who have had a hard time coming to church when they were in trouble because they felt that, that when you go to church you need to be okay. And that scares me. That scares me. So let's keep the balance. Now, let me give you another reason. That is, if everything is to be praised, and we all ask to be so happy all the time, then it may be that we have forgotten the need to confess our sins. Sometimes you may end up with having no gospel, only a lot of joyous expressions, but it always, in the Christian sense, comes through suffering and confession. So that the burden of guilt can be lifted away from you. Now, it is not possible to present a popular gospel always. Now, imagine, we want it to be to make it attractive, and we should. All the programs in our church should be made as attractive as possible. I like that if we're able to, to speak a language that other people are able to understand. 
you know, some of our expressions are difficult to understand. I hope it's an, we have an open community. But the Christian gospel has to be unpopular, at least in one respect. I know of no person who likes to be told that he or she is an egoist, a sinful, selfish person who needs to be converted. I also believe that if a person is told that and is presented for the solution in Jesus Christ, the happiness that that person will get far exceeds everything that can be, that he or she can be manipulated to feel by other means. Let me move on. The third point, true worship has always a doctrinal content. We spoke about the Buddha test. Notice that, that the emphasis in the book of Daniel on God's revelation in history, on the second coming, on resurrection, the kingdom of God, on the Sabbath. That's always part of it. Sometimes we think that the doctrines are, has nothing to do with our emotions. I hope you understand that, of course, they have. They should be linked to our personal life, but they are there. The fourth point, true worship is focused on God, not on man. That's the reason that God has a sanctuary in heaven. We are to focus on something we can't see and on a high priest whom we can't see at the moment, trusting in faith that he's there and he's uh, our representative. It's focused on someone else. I tell you, Sometimes we speak about left wings and right wings in the church or outside the church. Maybe these expressions are not too wise. But even if we use them, I find often that there is one similarity between the extreme charismatics on one hand and the very fundamentalist perfectionist on the other. The similarity is that they very often are very, very concerned with myself. Whether it's my emotional assurance that God is there or whether it is my, my inner perfection. We are not to focus on ourselves, but on God. And my final and fifth point, the foundation for genuine worship is in the Christian faith Christ as crucified. Our commitment is to the suffering Savior. That was a difference between Christianity and Islam. That is also part of the book of Daniel. I hope you realize that. I know at times that then when we present the book of Daniel or the book of Revelation, people are scared or they're scared before we go ahead. Very often I have, especially when the book of Revelation is taught, I've had people coming up to me telling me they have always been scared of the prophecies. They've always been scared about the second coming of Jesus. Because we have tended to emphasize all the, all the plagues and the tribulation, even forgetting actually the plagues are not hitting the people of God. We emphasize that sometimes a little too much. Now this is the book of Daniel. Christ, even in the Old Testament, is a central part. We are not able to understand the book of Daniel without understanding Christ. He is the center. The stone who was cut off. The Son of Man, the Prince of Hosts, the Anointed, the Messiah. And I have put in something I haven't mentioned. Worshipping with Christ in his spirit also means to pray for Babylon. I'm not saying Osama bin Laden this time, but I, I say praying for Babylon. How would you have reacted to King Nebuchadnezzar? He was the enemy, the Saddam Hussein of his time. He had taken the people into exile. He had destroyed the temple. Imagine you have had a prime minister in Australia, not here of course, in Australia, 
who would have said, well, I don't like these Adventists, so we ordered the police to go in and burn down the buildings at Fox Valley Road. Would you have liked him? Would you have gone into his service? And when he the first time had behaved like a mad king, would you then have tried a second time? And when he the second time actually had thrown your best friends into a fiery furnace, would you then still have been in his service representing God in the hope that this person might be converted? So that finally when Nebuchadnezzar actually worships and praises God, he is a person whom it was completely unthinkable some years earlier that would praise God. He is only doing it because of the example of Daniel. Darius, the king, actually learns to pray by Daniel. So, Christ prayed for his enemies. It's part of worshipping with Christ that we, are, we feel sorry for the world. You know, people without Christ may have a lot. They may fare better than me, actually. They may even be in dust. And it seems it's paying off. But there's one thing they haven't got. They have no savior. They don't know Jesus Christ. And what does it all matters if they do not know Jesus Christ? This is my final message to you from the book of Daniel and worshipping in the end time. It's better to have Christ than whatever you may have. So follow him, whether it pays off or not. Therefore also praying for all you meet that they may experience the same joy and calm and peace as you have in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Father in heaven, help us to understand that your word is rich beyond measures. Help us to realize that the book of Daniel is not simply a book about historical prophecies of fulfillment of tribulations and trials, but that it is also a book that speaks about our personal relationship to you in the midst of crisis, that speaks about Christ, the Messiah, the cutoff, the Prince of the Host. Help us to, to read these stories and these promises and these prophecies and be assured that though we have questions, you will intervene. Though we live in a time of trouble maybe or in personal life run into tragedy, then you will intervene. Though we may feel it takes a long time, that it is delaying, so we may ask the question, how long? The book of Daniel also assures us that just as you, God, rescued the friends of Daniel from the fire furnace and Daniel from the lion's den, so you will deliver your people in the days of the end. Jesus will come. His kingdom will be established and we will stand with him as heirs to the kingdom, not because of any righteous deed or merit that we have on our own, but because of your great mercy alone in Jesus Christ. Amen.